The sound of hammer blows echoed through the dark forest as German engineers worked hurriedly to repair the rail track. The Germans were nervous. They kept their weapons trained on the edge of the forest. In November 1942, the 6th Panzer Division was en route from France to reinforce the German army at Stalingrad. But the safety of its rail transports was a major concern for the Germans, even hundreds of miles behind the front. The division's commander was General Rouse. The thing that most concerned me was to make sure that the units we were transporting could go straight into battle when they arrived. Therefore, in partisan areas, we proceeded with caution. Trains had to go slowly, so they could break in time to avoid derailing on sabotage track. And there was the ever-present danger of an ambush. Rouse's division hadn't even reached the front yet, and already it was suffering its first casualties. On the 3rd of July, 1941, Stalin had made his first wartime radio broadcast to the Soviet people. Partisan detachments must be formed in areas occupied by the enemy to stir up guerrilla war everywhere, to blow up bridges and roads, sabotage telephone and telegraph lines, and to burn forests, stores and transports. We shall create intolerable conditions for the enemy and his supporters. They must be pursued and eliminated at every step. To organize the partisan war, a special unit was formed within Lavrenti Beria's NKVD secret police. Set up by Pavel Sudoplatov, the new unit was known as OMSPON, short for Independent Special Motorized Brigade. Its recruits included the best Soviet sportsmen. They would help to form the nucleus of sabotage groups which would be sent behind enemy lines. The recruits were sent to be trained at a new school for guerrilla warfare. Its students included an international battalion made up of hundreds of dedicated anti-fascists from Spain, Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia. Just two weeks after Stalin's directive, the Wehrmacht issued orders to combat the threat from Soviet partisans. All Axis units were to maintain a state of constant alert. Soldiers were forbidden from walking alone. Weapons were to be kept on their person and ready for use at all times. In the 1930s, Soviet strategic planning had assumed that, in the event of war, the Red Army would attack and fight the war on enemy soil. So, caches of weapons and food to support a guerrilla war on home soil had been destroyed. For the same reason, they had stopped training experts in guerrilla warfare. In 1941, this infrastructure had to be hurriedly re-established. Until it was, what training partisans received, if any, came from Red Army officers, few of whom were specialists in guerrilla warfare. And crucially, hardly any partisan units were equipped with radios. Little or no training, absence of radio communication and lack of coordinated action meant that of 2,800 partisan units formed in the summer of 1941, only 270 lasted into 1942. 
In Ukraine in 1941, the NKVD claimed to have established 778 partisan units and 622 sabotage groups. Theoretically, they consisted of 29,000 personnel. By June 1942, just 110 of these units were still in contact. In the midst of such chaos, only partisans led by experienced commanders like Vasily Korsh proved successful. Vasily Zakharovich Korsh was a committed Belarusian communist who had fought as a partisan against Polish forces in the 1920s. He was also a decorated volunteer of the Spanish Civil War. When war broke out, Korsh immediately began organizing local resistance. And just six days after the invasion, his partisans were the first to mount an attack against German troops. In May 1942, the central headquarters of the partisan movement was set up by the Stavka High Command. By November 1942, it recorded partisan strength as 90,000 personnel operating in 1,100 detachments. Central headquarters distributed 200 radio sets, which allowed it to communicate directly with the partisans to coordinate their actions and assign high priority targets. One such target was Rouse's 6th Panzer Division. Central headquarters had given the task of impeding its movement to two separate detachments, led by Saburov and Kovpak. Sidor Artimovich Kovpak was another experienced partisan leader who had his detachment up and running before the Germans arrived in his Ukrainian hometown in the summer of 1941. In 1943, his unit conducted the legendary Carpathian Raid sabotaging supply lines and wiping out isolated enemy garrisons in the course of a 600-mile advance to the Romanian border. While planning the war against the Soviet Union, Hitler had declared that the land was to be exploited to its fullest potential. The Wehrmacht's ultimate goal was a line running from Arkhangelsk in the north to Astrakhan in the south. Soviet territory was to be carved up into zones of occupation. Certain strategic areas, like the Crimea, would become part of a greater Germany. All was outlined in the top secret Generalplan Ost, Masterplan East. The plan spelled out a dark vision for Eastern Europe following the German victory over the USSR. It entailed a massive program of deportations, murder and enslavement of the native populations, followed by the colonization of the land by Germans and other racially acceptable peoples. All senior figures in the Third Reich became familiar with the Master Plan East. General Plan Ost, document number one, issued by SS Reichsführer Himmler on the 28th of May 1940. Top secret, national importance. On the 25th of May, I handed to the Führer a memorandum outlining my thoughts on the treatment of local populations in the occupied Eastern territories. The Führer read all six pages of my report, considered it correct, and warmly approved it. Most of those who escaped extermination were to be deported to Western Siberia. A minority, 10% of Poles, 25% of Belarusians, 35% of Ukrainians, were considered suitable for Germanization. Millions would be retained as slave labor. General Plan Ost would never be implemented. But those living under Nazi occupation still felt the effects of its brutal ideology. The Nazis planned to strip Eastern territories of all valuable resources. In 1941, special commissariats were established for the purpose. The special commissariat in Bielorussia was headed by Wilhelm Kuber. 
Wilhelm Kuber joined the Nazi party in the 1920s, when it was still on the fringe of German politics. He rose to become Gauleiter, or regional party leader, of Brandenburg. But he fell from favor after fabricating charges against a party rival. In June 1941, he was given a chance to redeem himself in Belarusia. When the Germans moved into a town or village, they would appoint a burgomaster or village headman. Public notices printed in Russian listed their responsibilities. All burgomasters and village headmen are responsible for safety in their area. Should the locals fail to ensure this, at least twice the number of dead German soldiers will be taken from the local population and shot. In the event of damage being done to roads, bridges or mines, at least three local people will be shot. Those who give shelter or food to strangers or render them any assistance without permission of their burgomaster or village headman will be hanged. It didn't take long for the brutality of the new regime to be felt, driving a deep wedge between invaders and the occupied. In the first winter of the war, the Germans began to deport hundreds of thousands of workers to the Reich, where they were to be used as slave labor. One and a half million people, most of them Ukrainians, were transported to the Reich. More than half a million girls were sent to become domestic servants in German households. The treatment such workers were to receive was outlined by Fritz Sarkel. All these people must be fed, housed and treated in such a way that the greatest results are achieved with the minimum outlay. SS chief Heinrich Himmler put it even more starkly. If 10,000 Russian women collapse from exhaustion while digging an anti-tank ditch, it interests me only insofar that Germany, at the end of it, has an anti-tank ditch. At the Nuremberg trials, Fritz Sarkel was found guilty of crimes against humanity and hanged. Himmler escaped a similar fate by committing suicide. In the spring of 1942, local police came to the village of Yarmashinka near Smolensk, looking for men of working age. When they entered the Agorov household, 18-year-old Mikhail was out. The family had decided not to wait for the deportations to begin. They packed their belongings and headed for the forest to join the partisans. They met a group of saboteurs in the forest. They were en route to the village of Selivoninka to blow up a bridge. Mikhail said he knew the way. On the 5th of May 1942, his 19th birthday, Mikhail Igorov was accepted into the special guerrilla regiment, codenamed the 13. Its commander was Sergei Grishin. Grishin began the war in a tank platoon. His unit became encircled during Operation Barbarossa, but Grishin escaped and returned to his home village to raise a partisan unit. It became Special Guerrilla Regiment the 13, named after Grishin's favorite action film by director Mikhail Rom. At dawn on the 13th of May 1942, the partisans walked 15 miles to attack the German garrison at Selivoninka. It was Mikhail Igorov's baptism of fire. Despite several local successes, the partisans failed to have any significant impact on the German supply chain. But the significance of their actions could be measured in other ways. 
thousands of German soldiers, urgently needed at the front, had to be diverted to fight the partisans and protect supply routes. German morale began to suffer too. In the occupied territories, anyone could be on the side of the partisans. No one could be trusted. Any suspicious noise could turn out to be the start of a partisan attack. The partisans wore at the nerves and resources of the German occupying forces. German reports state that of the 3.6 million Soviet prisoners of war they'd captured in 1941, by the spring of 1942, only 800,000 remained fit for work. 60% had been murdered or had died of starvation or disease. In the spring of 1942, thousands of Soviet prisoners of war sat or lay in the open at the Suwałki camp in Poland. They were given almost no food. Some had resorted to eating blades of grass. It was then that the former chief of staff of the 229th Rifle Division, Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Rodionov, decided to offer his services to the Nazis. He approached the Germans and offered to establish a fighting union of Russian nationalists. Their aim would be to overthrow Stalin's regime and establish a nationalistic Russian state under the protectorate of Germany. Rodionov's offer was taken up by the Nazi security service, the SD. Rodionov, who also used the alias Gil, was joined by a hundred former inmates of the Suwaki camp. They were issued with Czech military uniforms and became the first SS Russian volunteer detachment. The unit soon had 500 volunteers, most of whom were ex-Red Army officers. To prove their fighting ability and their loyalty, their first missions were conducted against Polish partisans. The detachment was later expanded to a brigade more than 2,000 strong. But despite the inhuman conditions, some prisoners remained steadfast. Nikolai Obrimba, a medic serving with a militia battalion, was taken prisoner in 1941 near Vitebsk. If you don't want to lose yourself in a desperate situation, you must purge your soul of doubts. Regardless of your feelings towards Stalin, there are two camps, two ideas, and two men leading those camps. And you shall support one idea, one camp, and one man embodying this idea. You shall hold on to the end for otherwise neither death nor torture will justify you in your own eyes. By the spring of 1942, the partisans were operating on a much larger scale across occupied Bielorussia, Ukraine, and Western Russia. Soviet reports estimated 200,000 partisans were now operating behind German lines. Partisan units were especially active in the rear of German Army Group North and Army Group Center. They made their camps in the forest and marshland around Bryansk, Vitebsk, Smolensk, Novgorod, and Leningrad. 
a large partisan unit operated in the mountains of the Crimea. The organization and tactics of the partisans were refined. A partisan detachment was a self-sufficient unit consisting of 100 to 200 fighters. It had its own commander, political officer, and chief of staff. Each detachment had support and medical services and could be divided into several platoons. Several detachments formed a partisan brigade. Each brigade had its own hospital and workshops, which produced camouflaged capes, sheepskin jackets, and boots. A brigade could be a few hundred or a few thousand strong. The Belarusian brigade Dubova, for example, had 1,700 members. Several brigades formed a partisan group used for strategic operations. In some areas, the partisans drove out local German forces completely and established enclaves wholly under their control. Near Polatsk in northeastern Belarusia, the partisans set up their own schools, telephone lines, mills and workshops. They printed their own newspapers and pamphlets, which they distributed to the 80,000 civilians living within the enclave. They even opened an art gallery, which exhibited the work of partisans including Nikolai Gutiev and Nikolai Obrimba, who had escaped from German captivity. Obrimba described what it meant to the partisans. The Dubova Brigade were proud of their paintings. That's why they put them in the headquarters, right next to the brigade's banner. We challenge the enemy. We can do anything, and our life doesn't depend on fear and death. We proclaim it for tomorrow and forever. The partisans could only operate with the help of the local population. Villagers brought them food and sometimes information, which was vital to both their success and their survival. It required great courage on the part of the villagers. If they were caught by the Germans, not only they, but their whole communities might suffer brutal reprisals. On the 13th of May 1943, Hitler signed the orders approving Operation Citadel, the Kursk Offensive. As if in reply, the partisans blew up both bridges over the river Desna near Bryansk, cutting the main supply route to the build-up area for the offensive. It took 12 days for German engineers to get both bridges back in action. This delay on the eve of the offensive was serious. If it happened again, at the height of the battle, it could be catastrophic. Therefore, in the weeks leading up to the Kursk offensive, the German high command ordered large-scale anti-partisan sweeps using frontline combat troops, including panzer regiments. The largest of these operations took place around Bryansk and was codenamed Operation Gypsy Baron. About 50,000 soldiers took part in the operation, including local collaborators. They faced several partisan brigades with a combined strength of approximately 11,000. The partisans were hindered by the fact that many women, old people and children had fled to the forest to join them. It made the partisans less mobile and less able to move their camp in a hurry. The Germans managed to separate the partisan brigades and drive them against the Desna River. The headquarters of the partisan movement took immediate steps to assist. They flew in weapons, ammunition and medical supplies and evacuated about 900 wounded partisans and others most at risk. Soviet aircraft bombed enemy troop concentrations, but partisan casualties mounted rapidly. They were outgunned and outnumbered. On the night of the 2nd of June, fierce fighting erupted at the Pionersky farm, 
as the partisan detachments attempted to fight their way out of the trap. They succeeded, but at a heavy price. As soon as German regular units returned to the front, partisan detachments began to reform in the forest. That summer, Central Headquarters used radio to coordinate a massive partisan assault on the German rail network at the very height of the Battle of Kursk. It was codenamed Operation Rail War. There was one problem. To disrupt German rail transport on the scale envisaged would require thousands of tons of explosives, more than could be flown in by air. So the sabotage groups began to experiment. <laughs> Before the war, it was thought that between 200 and 400 grams of TNT were needed to destroy a rail track. But experiments with different rhomboid and trapezium-shaped charges showed that a rail track could be blown up with as little as 75 grams. This discovery reduced the quantity of explosives needed by more than half and made it an amount that could be delivered by air. Operation Rail War began on the night of the 3rd of August, 1943. Railways were blown up across Bielorussia, Leningrad, Orel and Bryansk. But the results of Operation Rail War and Operation Concert that followed in September were disappointing. The Germans soon learned how to minimize any disruption. Trains traveled with their own track repair crews who would make quick temporary fixes to get the train moving again. Once the unit was passed, the rails could be replaced. Ilya Starinov, a famous Soviet saboteur, questioned the wisdom of blowing up the tracks. He thought it was better to blow up the trains. But the rail war did have an impact. The head of transport for Army Group Center reported figures for August 1943. Partisan activities in August resulted in an average of 45 track demolitions per day and damage to 266 locomotives and 1,373 railroad cars. One of the partisans' greatest achievements during the Battle of Kursk was to blow up the Osipovichy railway station. The mission was carried out by special guerrilla detachment, the Brave Men, led by a colonel from Omsbon, Alexander Rebtsevich. A Russian engineer working for the Germans managed to attach two magnetic mines to the fuel tanks. The explosion destroyed 33 fuel tankers, 65 ammunition wagons, eight Tiger tanks, seven armored vehicles, 12 food wagons, five locomotives, and the entire rail junction. The station was burning for two days. The partisans were 200 meters from the railway line. With the machine gun covering them, Mikhail Igorov and a comrade crawled quietly towards the railway embankment. Wooden barricades lined both sides of the track. They were hung with barbed wire and tin cans, which would rattle and alert the German sentries if anyone tried to sneak past. In the dark, working by touch, the partisans carefully cut away at the wire. 
a German patrol passed by. It took them an hour to cut their way through. Then they heard a train approaching. They rushed to the rails to plant the explosives. They buried the TNT, then tied a piece of string to the fuse pin and attached the other end to a ramrod. This they drove into the ground 50 centimeters away. The Germans put empty wagons at the front of the train, which would trigger a simple pressure mine and take the force of the blast. But this mine was different. The empty wagons passed harmlessly overhead, but the locomotive, whose running gear overhung the side of the track, knocked down the ramrod and pulled out the fuse pin. It was the latest example of ingenuity in a constantly evolving war between Soviet saboteurs and German transport officers. Soon, the Germans would devise a countermeasure and the saboteurs would have to think of something new. By the spring of 1944, Mikhail Igorov had derailed five trains and destroyed five bridges. He was awarded the Red Star Medal the Medal of Glory, third class, and the Partisan Medal, first class. According to statistics from the German General Directorate of Eastern Railways, Partisans carried out approximately 500 raids and acts of sabotage in February 1943, rising to 700 in April and to more than 1,000 per month in May and June. A derailed train blocked the line for about eight hours, so to bring movement to a complete halt required three derailings per day. This simple arithmetic was making life hell for the Germans. A kite soared 300 feet above the dark forests of Belarusia. Up towards it crept a little sail on wooden rollers. When it reached the kite, its cargo of leaflets was knocked loose and scattered across the forest below. Each leaflet was an appeal to the men of Lieutenant Colonel Rodionov's brigade of Russian nationalists, urging them to join with the partisans. In fact, many of these men had already begun to question their new allegiance after seeing the brutal way Germans treated their fellow Russians. Rodionov himself had been shocked at the way the Nazis were operating in the East. He had been promised an alliance. He now knew it was all lies. He sent a delegation to make contact with the partisans. Rodionov asked what guarantees the partisans could give for his own safety and that of his men. The partisans radioed Moscow the reply came straight from General Ponomarenko, head of the central headquarters of the partisan movement. Командир, расшифровали сообщение. Дать гарантию усилить агитацию, использовав любую связь, в том числе личную переписку с Гиле Родионовым для разложения его бригад. Partisan leader Ivan Chetkov met with Rodionov. As a result, almost his entire brigade came over to the Soviet side. It was renamed the first anti-fascist partisan brigade. Within weeks, the brigade was in action against its former masters, attacking a German police garrison in the village of Stujunka. The partisans attacked at dawn with mortars and machine guns. By 7 a.m., they had stormed the village and wiped out the German garrison. For this successful operation, Rodionov was promoted to colonel and decorated with the Order of the Red Star. Many of the men in his unit went on to receive the Partisan of the Patriotic War Medal. 
Meanwhile, General Commissar Wilhelm Kuber continued his brutal reign in Belarusia. In the summer of 1943, the NKVD intelligence department made his assassination a top priority. The task was assigned to all partisan units operating in the Minsk area. The hunt for Wilhelm Kuber was on. On the 22nd of July, a huge explosion tore through the Minsk theater. Soviet intelligence reported that 70 enemy soldiers had been killed and 110 wounded, but that Kuba had left the theater a few minutes before the explosion. Weeks later, a partisan unit ambushed Kuba on his way to his country residence, but he escaped again. The partisans suggested bombing Kuba's residence from the air. The mission was assigned to 15 crews from an elite long-range bomber unit. But Cuba survived once more and moved his residence into the city. On the 6th of September, a banquet was held in Minsk to mark the 10th anniversary of Hitler's rise to power. A bomb in the officers' mess killed 36 military and government officials, but Cuba wasn't there. Then Yelena Mazanik, Cuba's housemaid, was contacted by partisan Maria Osipova. Maria told Yelena about the terrible crimes for which Cuba was responsible. She persuaded her to carry out an act of revenge and gave her a delayed action mine. On the morning of Tuesday, the 21st of September, Yelena Mazanik put the mine in her bag and went to work. Locals were always searched when entering the General Commissar's residence, but that day, Yelena was lucky. She knew the supervisor. The search was a formality. She went into Cuba's bedroom and put the mine underneath the mattress, below where his head would lie. Maria Osipova, Yelena Mazanik, and her sister Valentina were smuggled out of the city to a partisan safe house. That night, shortly before 1 a.m., General Commissar Wilhelm Kuber was asleep in his Minsk residence when the mine exploded. The mine that killed Cuba had a directional force that ensured it only killed its target. Neither Cuba's pregnant wife nor his children sleeping in the next room were harmed. By the beginning of 1944, Soviet records showed 300,000 partisans under arms. There were nearly 150 radio sets in use in Belarusia alone. The partisans now had a dedicated air unit, the 101st Long Range Aviation Regiment, which flew 20 missions to the partisans every night. In the spring of 1944, the Germans planned a massive operation to destroy the partisan enclave near Polatsk in northern Belarusia. They deployed 60,000 soldiers, 137 tanks, 236 guns, 70 aircraft, and two armored trains. 60,000 partisans and civilians found themselves encircled by units of the German 3rd Panzer Army, which quickly seized control of all their airfields. So the partisans built a new one on a hill in the middle of the marshes. Наша задача построить взлетную полосу. Тяжело будет. The partisans needed to fill the bog with soil to make a strip at least 1,000 meters long. Logs were laid first, then tightly packed brushwood, and then soil on top. 2,000 peasants from the local village, supervised by Nikolai Obrimba, worked on the strip for three weeks. Pits were dug for fires to act as landing lights. Carpenters made hatches with iron bottoms. 
To put the light out quickly, you pulled a rope tied to the prop that held up the hatch. To support the partisans, the Soviet Air Force carried out 354 missions. These included bombing raids against German positions, ferrying in 250 tons of supplies, and evacuating about 1,500 casualties. But the pressure from heavily armed German troops was relentless. At the end of April, the surviving partisans attempted to break out. At first, partisan brigades tried to coordinate their actions with the Army High Command. But communications broke down, and each unit had to fight its own way out as best it could. By the 27th of April, the Germans had forced the last partisans into a pocket just 20 kilometers wide. The local commander ordered the survivors to break out at all costs, and eight days later, they succeeded in leading 15,000 civilians to safety. At the forefront of the fighting was Colonel Rodionov's first anti-fascist brigade. During his service with the German security forces, Rodionov had led his brigade in punitive actions against Belarusian civilians and had taken part in the destruction of five villages along the Berezina River. Now, Rodionov atoned for these crimes with his own blood. During the breakout, Rodionov was killed while persuading his soldiers to stand up and attack the enemy. His remains were rediscovered in 1992 and reburied in a communal grave for partisans in the town of Uschachi. One month after the fall of the partisan enclave, the Red Army launched Operation Bagration. Soviet regular forces drove the enemy from all parts of Belarusia. Many partisans joined the ranks of the Red Army. In the small hours of the 1st of May 1945, one former partisan, Mikhail Igorov, alongside Sergeant Meliton Kantaria, was in the heart of Berlin, climbing to the very top of the Reichstag building. Igorov had brought a sack containing the assault banner of the 756th Rifle Regiment of the 150th Rifle Division. They were covered by their commanding officer, Lieutenant Alexei Berest. Behind Mikhail Agorov lay two years of the deadly partisan war, a serious shoulder wound, and service as a Red Army infantry scout in Poland and Germany. Ahead lay a few steps to the roof of the Reichstag and to victory.